Well, it's very good to be with you. And today we're thinking about Psalm 65 as we continue on our pathway through the Psalms. And Psalm 65 is another Psalm penned by David. And the Psalm centers around describing the great blessings of God. And as we see from the very first verse, this is a Psalm of praise for the great wonders and works of God through creation. And so we will see David's praise for God's grace, for God's might, and God's prosperity to humanity. This is a worship psalm that could have been sung at any time, but due to the language of fulfilling vows and receiving plentiful harvests, this was likely a psalm used during the Feast of Tabernacles. And this feast was one of the most joyful feasts of the Jewish people, lasting eight days in which the people of Israel celebrated the abundance of the harvest crops. Furthermore, this is only one of three psalms that uses the word atone or atonement, which helps us to tie the psalm to the Feast of Tabernacles because the Day of Atonement occurred five days uh, before that particular feast. So let's think first then about God of grace, the God of grace, the first four verses. Praise is due to you, O God in Zion, and to you shall vows be performed. O you who hears prayer, to you shall all flesh come. When iniquities prevail against me, you atone for our transgressions. Blessed is the one you choose and bring near to dwell in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, the holiness of your temple. So the psalm begins with David declaring that praise rightfully belongs to God in Zion. And the psalm begins with what seems to be a very nationalistic psalm about the people of Israel and their feasts and offerings being performed at the sanctuary in Jerusalem. But verse two expands this worship psalm to all people. O you who hears prayer, to you shall all flesh come. So this uh, psalm expresses a universal need to come to God. All people on the earth, not just the Jewish people, not just God's chosen people, all people must come to God. And verse three describes the crux of the problem for humanity. When iniquities prevail against me, you atone for our transgressions. When we read these words before the coming of Christ, we recognize that this is what the people of Israel understood God to be doing for them. The people recognize that their sins were against them and that God was making atonement for their sins. God was willing to make a covering uh, for our sins. And notice that David does not say that the animals sacrificed atoned for the people's transgressions. David knew better than this. He says that it is God who is covering the people's sins. David is declaring what Paul would then be teaching to the Ephesians. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love uh, for us, even when we were dead in our trans transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. The people needed a saviour. God continued to show mercy toward the people by covering over their sins. But justification for God's favourable treatment of us had to come through the death of his own son. So one of the roles of the Messiah was to come to the people of Israel to save them from their sins. But there is another blessing that comes from the God of grace. Not only were the people's sins covered, but the people could be brought near to God. Blessed is the one you choose and bring near to dwell in your courts, we read in those verses. Well, this is a beautiful picture of our ability to come near to God. Can you imagine what a source of confidence it was to the people to have God dwelling in the centre of the camp? God dwelling in the tabernacle. A cloud over the tabernacle in the day and a fire over the tabernacle at night. God was with his people and it was a great blessing to see God dwelling in their midst each day. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, the holiness of of your temple. So the connection is that when God is near us, we can be satisfied. We will find provisions from the Lord when we remain near the Lord. God's goodness overflows from his presence. Goodness and righteousness surround God, and we should desire to be near it all. And that is what David is bringing out in these first uh, four verses as we think about the God of grace. Well, let's then move on to verses five to eight as we think about the God of might. 
By awesome deeds, you answer us with righteousness, O God of our salvation, the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas, the one who by his strength established the mountains, being girded with might, who stills the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves, the tumult of the peoples, so that those who dwell at the ends of the earth are in awe at your signs. You make the going out of the morning and the evening to shout for joy. So the second section of the psalm describes the power and might of the Lord. And this stanza mentions two specific displays of God's power in the earth. In verse six, we read, the one who by his strength established the mountains being girded with might. The mountains of the earth show God's power and might. We cannot move the mountains. Uh, it is a feat for us just to blaze a tunnel through a mighty mountain. To stand on top of any of the mountains of the earth is a majestic experience. God put these mountains on the earth to show his might. The second way God shows his might is described in verse 7, who stills the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves, the tumult of the peoples. I mean, the waves of the ocean, again, are absolutely fascinating when you consider their power. The power of a wave is unbelievable. Stand in the ocean and... Uh, you know, notice how a wave will just push you back. And even with all of your might to walk forward, you will be pushed back by the ocean's waves. Dive under a wave and you feel the great force of it as it passes. The calming yet powerful sound of the waves crashing on the shore reminds us of God's power. So why does the psalmist record these events in nature? Well, verse eight tells us that we are to be in awe of the signs of God. These things exist so that we would seek after God. These are permanent signs that our, that our parents enjoyed, that we enjoy, and that our children and their children's children can enjoy. All of it speaks to the power of God. And the power is there to show us something very important. We see that in verse five. By awesome deeds, you answer us with righteousness, O God of our salvation, the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas. These things remind us of God's power to answer prayer. David is telling us to look at the earth to see what God can do and to remember that this same power is working to answer us. So God of grace, God of might. And thirdly, God of prosperity. And this is from verse 9 to 13. You visit the earth and water it. You greatly enrich it. The river of God is full of water. You provide their corn for you provide their corn for so you have prepared it. You water its furrows abundantly, settling its ridges, softening with showers and blessing its growth. You crown the year with your bounty. Your wagon tracks overflow with abundance. The pasture of the wilderness overflow. The hills gird themselves with joy. The meadows clothe themselves with flocks. The valleys deck themselves with corn. They shout and sing together for joy. So the third and final section of this psalm describes the, bount the bountifulness of God to his people. Uh, you know, we're not so much of an agrarian society anymore. Uh, so we need to place ourselves back in history as people who lived off of the land and farmed it for sustenance and pay. Although we are, of course, aware of all that in the place where we live, as we see uh, the changing fields through the seasons, as we see the uh, tractors coming and going. We're very aware of the earth. But even more so, much more so it would have been for the people back uh, in David's day when he wrote this psalm. So the first part describes the watering of the land for crops. David declares it is God who visits the earth and waters it. This brings about the grain uh, from planting. Further, God brings the showers on the earth to soften it for farming, by which people receive the blessing of growth from their harvest. In verse 11, David continues by describing the harvest that people enjoy because God has made the earth profitable. Isn't it interesting the different types of soil that exist on the earth so that all sorts of crops can be planted and harvested? 
you know, God hasn't missed anything. Even different soils so that different plants can grow. This is not a random chance, but a thoughtful God who has prepared these things for humanity. And then verses 12 to 13 describe the blessings of God as the pastures and the hills are made ready for the animals to eat and find provision. The earth is made ready by God for the people to harvest. One of the keys to this section is a description of the abundance of the harvest. In verse nine, we read, you greatly enrich it and the river of God is full of water. Verse 10, you water its furrows abundantly. Verse 11, you crown the year with your bounty and your wagon tracks overflow with abundance. Here is a picture of the cart having so much crop, uh, so, you know, so much crops that, that some of the harvest is falling off the cart and being left behind on the ground. And finally, in verse 12, we read, the pastures of the wilderness overflow. So this final section is all about how God blesses abundantly. God is not stingy when he does these things for the earth. God is overflowing with his blessings to all flesh. So what applications can we draw then from this psalm? Well, we need to see that God blesses us abundantly in so many various ways. David tries to remind us of how much God gives to the people of the earth. God blesses us through material things. And we must consider that the things we have are a blessing from God. God has set the earth up in such a way that we can be prosperous while we live here. There are other planets in our own solar system that cannot sustain life, but are desolate wastelands. How amazing that we are placed on this planet that not only has the ability to sustain life, uh, but is able to give great abundance to the people who live on it. The earth continues to remain and be productive, even though people may think uh, that we're destroying it. And of course, with COP26 and all that we think about uh, with climate change and biodiversity and all these things, of course, we need to be considering these things at all times. But it's remarkable, too, that God has not made a delicate earth, but he has created a planet that can be useful for people uh, with their technology in 2000 BC as much as it can be uh, all these years later, sort of 2000 AD. So there's something very robust about the earth. God has designed it that way. And second, God has given us the beautiful things that we see in creation to know that he exists. We are able to look at the mountains and the waves and know that there is power in this world and that someone put these things in motion for us. The earth is accomplishing God's purpose. God's love is so great that these things were placed here so that we would know that there is a powerful creator who answers our prayers. If God can set these things in motion by his own divine will and accomplish his purpose, how much more can God do for those that he loves so much, loves so much that he created all this for us and gave up his son for us? It's an extraordinary thing. And finally, we see God's blessings through the grace he has offered to all of humanity. Our iniquities continue to prevail against us. We are not living the way we should. All of us sin and are falling short of the holiness and glory of God. But God, rather than issue wrath against us, made atonement for our sins. God is merciful and covers over the sins that we have committed. But he must remain just. Just as much as a judge can be merciful, he must also be fair. Fair and just and keep the requirements of the law. So to be able to show us mercy, a price has to be paid. And the price was the sacrifice of his only son. This would allow God to be just by covering our sins. And this atonement is found in the blood of Christ. And it's atonement that David speaks of in this psalm looking forward to that final fulfillment in Christ. But this forgiveness, of course, is not automatically applied. We are required to come to Christ through repentance and faith. And we're made pure in the sight of God if we will simply come to Jesus and offer him our lives today. So let's then pray as we think about the God of grace, the God of might 
and the God of prosperity. We thank you, Lord, for this psalm. We thank you that you are a God of grace who has graciously provided for us. Thank you that that is seen most obviously in your son, Jesus Christ. But we think how even in this psalm, you know, David is talking about atonement and having our sins covered and enabling us to come into the presence of God. It's all about your grace. And it's all about your might. As we look at the world around us, the mountains, the waves, the power of God, we thank you that you are such a great and mighty God. And thank you, Lord, for uh, the prosperity that you have blessed us with, the fruitful earth. And we thank you, Lord. And we thank you uh, for the crops in season, all that we enjoy. We thank you, Lord, for this world that you have created. We give you thanks for who you are, our mighty God, and our God who has met us in his own son, Jesus Christ. Amen.